So today I get to continue our series on home improvement, and today I get to talk about the garage, all right? Did you know that 25% of Americans who have a two-car garage can't put one car in it? <laughs> they don't even address the one-car scenario, <laughs> you know what I'm Two-car garage can't put one car in it, all right? And then, according to the National Soap and Detergent Association, getting rid of clutter would clo uh, slim your housework down by 40%. That's pretty amazing, isn't it? That there's actually a National Soap and Detergent Association. Can you believe that? <laughs> it floored me, okay? I couldn't believe it, okay? Do you know we'll spend one year, listen to this, one year of our life looking for stuff that we lost in our stuff. What? Are you kidding me? A year of my life? How many's been looking for something? Anybody? Woo, I've been there, done that, you know. If you rent, the last one, if you rent a storage facility, okay, you're actually contributing uh, for, your, for your excess belongings, you're actually contributing to 154 billion, billion, billion dollar industry, all right? To put that in perspective, bigger than the Hollywood film business. Can you believe that? Wow. Stuff. We have it, don't we? We've got lots and lots of stuff. Did you know the garage is one of the most misused rooms in the house? It generally is never used for the car, but it's been a bedroom, a living room, a game room, a shop, storage room, a catch-all. A man cave, any man caves out there in the garage? Don't raise your hand, it's okay. I mean, no. I mean, it's been everything, it's been everything but an actual garage for a car. And you know, the, car, the garage sort of, it reflects our lives, you know, it sort of reflects who we are as Americans and we get busy and we're in our day to day and so much going on, so much in it. We have more to do than we can do. Anybody agree to that? Uh, it, just more to do. I don't know if you feel like I do, but uh, we get ready. You know, school's kicking back up here in a few weeks, and we'll be getting up and in the morning, and we're going to try to get our little three-year-old boy ready for daycare, and then try to get the other two boys ready for school, and then me and my wife, we're going to try to get each other ready. You know, <laughs> Like, are you okay? You going to make it? Yeah, I'm going to make it, I think, all right? So we're dragging kids to the car, trying to get everybody out on time, and got to go to work, and come home. We got honey-do's and honey-don'ts. We got you know, mowing the grass, and somebody's got to wash dishes. Somebody's got to fold the clothes. Has anybody boycotted folding clothes yet? No? Okay. Well, man, I was hoping that cause was going to catch off. Anyway, um, somebody's got to do the work. I mean, it's just so much to do. And if you got teenagers or kids getting a little older, now you got to deal with their schedule. I mean, you got to get them to tennis and soccer and football and choir and band and, you know, golf lessons and music lessons and, you know, they're just busy going everywhere. And somewhere amidst all of that, we got to try to go to church. Woo! Anybody feeling busy? <laughs> I'm feeling pretty busy right now, all right? And I got to say, we're, we, it's pretty easy these days to go to church. Back when I was a kid, we was going to church five nights a week. Anybody? We was doing Wednesday night, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Thursday night prayer, Friday night social. What, I mean, you know, it's just always. And then I don't know how many we can, we can revive us we'd have a month. It felt like, you know, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. So it's hard, but it's hard to get it all in. It's hard to get it all together. And it's like, man. And so today I want to talk about that. I just want to talk about our business, our lives, and being able to say yes and no to God in, in, in the right places. And can I vent for a second? I'm, I get mad. Anybody ever get mad? Have you ever got so mad that you could say, that got my gizzard? <laughs> some of y'all... <laughs> Some of y'all in this room say, got your gizzard, what? I mean, have you ever been so mad that it got your gizzard? That get my gizzard. Mm. I'm, mm, I, mm. Come here, I'm, I'm fixing that. You know, you know how, that kind of mad, you know, that's the kind of mad I'm talking about. Well, I got, you know, I want to vent just like my... The most frustrating thing in the world to me, the most frustrating, I'm just telling you, to the very nth degree frustrating to me, is when I grab one of my boys, one of my sweet little Cunningham boys. You got a photo of them. Oh, look at, look at them boys. 
That's a cute little family right there, ain't it? Don't let them deceive you. They're not near as sweet as they look. Okay, <laughs> there, boys. I can say, hey, son, Caleb, uh, Mark, go take that trash to the can. I mean, why are you always asking me? I got to do everything around here. I'm like, what? Everything. I mean, you got, I asked you to take the garbage and you got to do everything. I mean, I'm like, ugh. Ugh. Or how about this? You know, won't you ask that? Well, let me ask him to do it. Or, hey, I don't have time. Or, hey, how about this? Uh, this is my favorite one. One of my favorite ones of all time, right? Hey, Dad, I'm almost done with this level. Let me get down with this level, and I'll go do that. I'll take care of that for you. I'm like, I'm going to take that whole level. Everything you got, I'm going to throw it out in the yard. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Son, yeah, thank you, Don. You don't know what kind of crazy I'm about to undo on you. <laughs> or I'm on FaceTime, or I got a text, I got to check my, my Instagram, I got to check my Snapchat. I mean, hold on, just a second. I'll do it just, I mean, it's the most frustrating thing. I'm like, just do what I say. Woo! I don't know if it feels good for you for me to say it like that, but it feels good for me to say it like that. I'm like, ah, it's frustrating. It's frustrating. When my kids treat me that way, you know what's really going on is I'm like, I'm not getting the priority that I deserve, you know? I'm like, how can your life be so busy with video games, Snapchat, texting, calling? Oh, and this one too. I love this one. Hey, uh, uh, Dad, I, w- I would, m- Mom just asked me to do something different. <laughs> when you get you and your mom, y'all come in right now, both y'all. <laughs> yeah. We're about to have a talk right now. <laughs> Your mama's in trouble too. No, I mean, y'all, for those who know my wife, I'd be in trouble. I'd be the one in trouble. She's sweet, but Lord have mercy. Okay. But, I, you know, it's just frustrating when I'm trying to get something done. I'm like, could you just do what I ask you to do? I mean, seriously, one time, just say yes, sir, and go do it. Go do it. And at the height of my frustration, when I'm angriest, when I don't know what else to do, I'm about to punch a wall. Like I hear God say to me, that's exactly how I feel. Now, I understand not every preacher hollers. <laughs> but I get excited. Just think of me more like a coach, okay? <laughs> I'm, I'm the coach on the sidelines. Come on! You know, like. All right, yeah, what was I just saying before y'all distracted me? I had a great point. I know I did. Oh, I was mad at my kids, but I passed that point yet. I was about to punch a wall. Did I punch somebody? Oh, just before I do that, God said, hey, he says this is where, you know, I feel the same way. That's exactly right. That's where I was. Y'all quit distracting me. Stop. All right. But God feels that way about us. He feels that way about us. He's like, hey, I got people I need you to minister to. I need you to go to Peru. I need you to go to Africa. I need you to go to Israel. I got people that I want you to do my kingdom work for. And and, and people are like, well, hey, God, could you ask somebody else? I mean, I got this thing. You know what I'm saying? I'm kind of busy. I got something going on. And I know God loves us just like I love my children. But sometimes I know he's like, hmm. Come here, boy. I'm fi- Ooh, yeah, you know, turn with me before I punch somebody. Just feel it coming on me. Y'all don't come to me after church. I'm liable to punch you. I don't even want to. <laughs> just, it's building up, you know. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's building. It's going to have to come out somewhere. <laughs> I'm picking. I'm not going to punch you if you come to me after church. Oh, <laughs> Luke 14, <laughs> verse 16. Luke 14, chapter 14, verse 16. I'll share a little story with Jesus followed up. Luke 14, chapter 14, verse 16. Jesus followed up. Yes, for there was once a man who threw a great dinner party and invited many. And when it was time for dinner, he sent out his servants to the invited guests saying, come on in. The food's on the table. Man, isn't that like one of the best feelings ever Sunday afternoon? Like you're over at mama's house or you're over at someone's house or maybe... You're getting ready to order. You know what I'm saying? When they, like, everybody's attention, it just all changes when the food heads to the table. You know, it's like, isn't that a great feeling? That's the moment. That's where we're at. He's like, hey, the food's ready. All the preparation's done. We don't have to worry about cooking no more. I know you've been smelling it for an hour, but it's ready. 
It's time to eat. Come on in. He said, then at that moment, they all began to beg off one after another, making excuses. The first said, hey, I bought a piece of property, and I need to go look it over. Send my regrets. The other said, I bought teams of oxen. I need to go check them out. Send my regrets. And yet another said, I just got married, and I need to go home to my wife. Not going to make it. Can you imagine? Have you ever heard of anybody who bought a piece of property without looking at it first? I mean, let's go back. We're not talking about some backyard barbecue where everybody just swing by. Now, mind you, if you're having a backyard barbecue, let me know them digits, and I'll swing on by and check it out, all right? But that's not the occasion we're talking about. We're not talking about a backyard barbecue. We're talking about something official, something that you'd have to reserve a spot at, something that, you know, it's like, hey, save the date. Anybody ever got one of those save the dates? You know, save the date. We got a dinner that's coming up. You don't want to miss this dinner, and you've been cordially invited. So let me know, are you coming? That's the kind of event. So these people were friends with this guy. They knew him. He knew them. They had relationship. They knew ahead of time there was just going to be a great party, and they knew they were invited. But they waited to the last minute. They waited to that last second when supper was on the table, when everything had been prepared and was ready. And then they say, hey, I bought a piece of property. I got to go check it out, man. I ain't going to make it. What? You don't buy a piece of property without looking at it first. You don't buy a team of oxen without going to look at them, make sure they're breathing you know what I mean? Whoever would buy a, a tractor and whatever, you know, you could put it in our day. Why would you buy it without looking at it first? You wouldn't. So the excuse is flimsy at best. And then the third one is about as personal as it gets. Huh? Took me a while to get my head around this one. I'm like, He's going home to his wife. What's wrong with that? I mean, that's a good thing. No, before he had relationship with her, before he had someone special in his life, it's obvious that he had relationship with this man. He had a friend. It's obvious that they knew each other. And rather than share his wife with him and share that relationship with him, he's like, you know what? Now that I got somebody else, you're not a priority to me anymore. That's personal, isn't it? It's like, oh. Mm. What? Are you ashamed of me? Are you, I mean, you don't say, you, are you ashamed of us? I mean, we were good friends. I mean, I, I, y'all, you ain't, you're not coming? Man, I cooked, I cooked, I, I want to meet your wife. No, I'm good. I'm going home. I don't have time. I, you know, we don't have time. The servant went back and told the master what had happened. And the master was outraged and told the servant, quickly, get out into the city streets and the alleys. And collect all who look like they need a square meal. (laughs) You see, this party's changing a little bit, right? You see that changing? It's actually talking about two groups of people. One group wouldn't receive it, the invitation. The other group rejected the invitation. This was an invitation-only party, right? But in this moment, the party's changing. I like that because, I mean, really, it's where we got invited. (laughs) Okay, we we were invited uh, as, as outsiders to this party, but the, but the requirement for the party is changing. And so now the master is saying, look, quickly go out to the streets and collect anybody who needs a meal. Get all the misfits. Get the homeless. Get the wretched. Get anybody you can get your hands on, right? And bring them here. The servant reported back, master, I did what you commanded, and there's still room. Man, that's exciting. And the master said, then go to the country roads. Whoever you find, drag them in. I want my house full. Let me tell you, not one of those originally invited, not one of those who rejected the invitation, not one of those who said no to me, will even so much as taste a bite at my dinner party. Do you know what the one requirement is to be at the dinner party today? Do you know? It's one word. Just simply say yes. Somebody who will say yes. Yes to God. Yes to his plans. Yes to his way. Say, you know what? Hey, you want to come over and have T-bone with me tonight? Anybody? Oh, you ain't invited. (laughs) 
Hey, if you got if you got pot roast cooking at home with cornbread and collard greens, and you need somebody else to sit at your table, ask me and see what I say. I'm gonna say yes. If you hit me up and say, hey, you want to go to Longhorns? You want to you know, go out to Outback? I don't know. You want to go to some restaurant today and eat? Yeah, what am I going to I'm like, anybody with me? It's not that difficult. We're talking about a good time. We're talking about a good meal. Sure, I'm in. I'm in. I'm going to say yes. So the one requirement is just saying yes. Now I want to give you four ways to say yes. <laughs> Can I give you four ways to say yes this morning? The first way to say yes is to say yes to salvation. Amen. God wants to save you. He wants to save you. The Bible says no man comes to the Father except the Spirit draw him. Can I just plead with you this morning? If the Spirit is knocking on your heart, if the Holy Spirit of God is drawing you to the Father, please say yes. Don't be guilty of saying no. I've seen this all my life. And it's called a white knuckle syndrome. Have you ever heard of it? It's when somebody's sitting in the pew and they've grabbed a hold to the front pew and they're squeezing it so tight the blood has left their knuckles, right? It's just a... And you don't know. They're about to get up and run. They're going to do two things. They're going to run to the altar or run out the church. <laughs> if you got knuckle syndrome this morning, don't run from God. Say yes to God. Say yes to him. The second way to say yes is say yes to healing. Say yes to healing. James 5, 16. It's one of my favorite verses in the Bible. I quote it all the time. Confess your faults one to another and pray for one another that you may be what? Healed. Maybe you're saved. Maybe you've received Jesus and you're following him and you committed your life to him. But at the end of the day, you got a lot of junk. A lot of junk in your home. Maybe you're busted up marriage and your kids' relationships are terrible. You don't know how to manage money and you're struggling to be an employer or you're wrestling to be an employee and you're like, hey, where do I go from here? I can tell you, say yes to healing. What's that mean? It means say yes to the relationships that God puts in your life. Iron sharpening iron, right? Anybody want to say yes this morning? The third way to say yes is say yes to restoration. Say yes to God breathing new life into you. Say yes to God taking those dreams and visions. You know, the ones that the enemies told you would never happen. The ones that Satan would love for you to believe. You're too far gone. You've messed up. You'll never get back. The relationship that'll never heal, that'll never mend. Let God do the work of restoration in you and then in your life. Say yes to that. And the fourth one, anybody know what I'm going to say? I'll give you a hint. God wants to save you. Heal you, restore you, and fulfill you. Say yes to fulfillment. What's that mean? It means to feel full. (laughs) It means to wake up in the morning knowing that I have purpose. Wake up in the morning knowing that you made a difference. Wake up in the morning knowing that your life matters. Wake up tomorrow knowing that, hey, you said yes to God and you're doing the things that he's called you to do. Say yes to fulfillment by saying yes to salvation. Yes to healing. Yes to restoration and that process in God. Yes, I will do the work you've called me to do. Say yes. And when you say yes to all these, you'll actually be able to say yes to the mission. To the mission. To the mission that God's going to call you on and put you on. Whether it be standing at the front door greeting and smiling as people come in and say, you know what? Welcome to Heritage Church. God loves you. Huh? Maybe it's up here singing with me. Maybe it's playing an instrument. It might be in the uh, video camera or sound room. It might be in kids ministry. It might be in youth ministry. I don't know. It might be on the prayer team. It might be over at the storehouse. There's so much that's going on here. But when you say yes to God and his process, he then connects you with the thing that gives you life. Now, as you say yes to ministry, there's just a couple of ways we've learned over the years some things. I'm going to give you some pointers if I can. There's some perspectives on how to look at ministry. We feel like we're sort of getting a handle on it, but there's ways to go wrong. And one of those ways is uh, to to engage in a wants-based ministry. Wants-based ministry is just where everyone is doing what he or she feels like doing. (laughs) That sounds pretty good, doesn't it? 
until you're laid on the floor needing somebody to resuscitate you, and somebody's like, oh, I just sing. That's why I'm... I don't feel like it. <laughs> you know, like want space is not where God's got us at. Needs based ministry is running from one need to the next. It's just like, hey, we need you to pick this up. Need you to go here. Need you to go there. The problem with that is you never connect with what God called you to do. So you're just meeting a need, 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 need. And don't get me wrong, thank God for meeting needs because we need needs met. But that's not our goal. Our goal is for you to not connect through needs. The next one is gift-based ministry. Gift-based is where everyone is doing only the things they are good at or comfortable doing. Like, hey, uh, the toilet's overflowing. Hey, I'm not comfortable with that. <laughs> I mean, I do a lot of things for God, but uh-uh. <laughs> Working in kids' men or back in the daycare with my wife, you know, it's like, hey, uh, we need to change that. Diaper. Okay, let me know when you get that done. <laughs> it's not my gift. <laughs> it's not. <laughs> right? I mean, if that's the way it were, it'd be terrible. It's not the way. So how do we want to do ministry? We want to do ministry mission-based. Mission-based ministries where everyone submitting their wants, needs, and gifts to the greater mission of the church. It's when you come in and you say, here's my passion, here's my desires, here's my gifts. God, I'm going to lay them at your feet. Now I trust you're going to put them to work. And I will do what you say you want me to do. When we say yes to God, that's how we need to say yes to God. Just a few nights ago, um, my wife calls me one evening. She's hysterical. She's all busted up and frantic. And she says, Mark, she's got to get here now. Where are you? Get here now. So I'm flying over there. She said, Branson, our, our three-year-old little boy, said he's, uh, said he's collapsed. He can't stand on his feet. He can't talk. Said he's slurring. Said he's, he can't even say mom. I mean, she's all, I mean, you know, you imagine. And man, the minute the phone hung up, my heart fell to the floor. I'm like, oh, God. So I, I go there as fast and as hard as I possibly can to get to her and to him. And when I get there, I come up on the scene to a little boy that... It's just wobbling around, can't stand to his feet, and he's crying frantically, and he's looking, ah, ah. And I knew, I'm like, get in the truck now. And so we got in the truck, and we weren't that far from the hospital, so I'm just flooring it. I know it's not the best response, but it was the only one I could do at the moment. I'm like, call 911, tell them we're on the way. We've got a little kid that can't respond. And so all the way to the hospital, He's trying to get to me. I'm driving. He's trying his best. And, and if anybody knows my three-year-old little boy, that fella can talk, okay? It's not like he's learning how. He knows what he wants to say. He's like, ah, ah. He's like, ah, daddy. I can't tell you what it feels like. To hear him crying out for me in his moment of need. We run into the hospital. We're carrying him in. And the emergency rooms are trying to receive us and get us taken care of. And nurses and walking through. And orient, just everybody on staff just trying to do their part and their role. And you see the multiplication of people. Just the amount of people it takes to try to serve us and get them to a room. And they're trying to see what's going on, you know, ordering tests, and we got to get blood work and CT scans, and doctor comes in and said, you know, ordering different stuff, but they can't really tell us nothing, and I got a little fella, can't, he's starting to talk now a little bit, but he can't, his words, he's slurring, and he's dizzy looking and, and vomiting, and I'm, you know, it's just a terrible, terrible scene, can I tell you, and then the nurse comes in and starts to try to put an IV in his arm, and and, and just being honest with you, I'm just giving you, a, just in my heart, my thought was, I hope she knows what she's doing. I hope she didn't wake up this morning and just decide, hey, I think I'm going to go do IVs at the hospital. Because that's what I want to do. But 
There's my baby laying in the hospital while strangers are taking care of him. He's on the table. And Kelly and I'm trying to comfort her. She's trying to comfort me. And we got friends comforting us, trying to say, hey, it's all going to be all right. And I'm like, God, I trust you. I know I trust you. And, 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 and in the middle of this, I know I got to preach. And got so much going on in my mind and just busy, hectic life. I hear God say, that's how I feel. So my children who sometimes barely have the strength to cry out, Daddy! Daddy! He said, they get the words out. And in the process, there's moments when bystanders are turning around saying, y'all, no, I'm not interested. People who are gifted, people who are called, people who know they should be working, they're like, I'm busy. We need men and women this morning, young men, young women, who will say, put me to work. Don't let one of your children fall on a bed and not get attention. I didn't need someone who showed up that was busy and was like, well, you know what? If y'all need me to put an IV in, I will. I didn't need somebody to show up and say, I'm the IV maker. God's gift to IVs, right? I need somebody who was connected and wanted and realized the need and said, you know what? There's a need right here. And they said, you know what? Hey, I've been trained to do this. This is my thing, whatever. And then I recognize that there's a situation here that I need to apply my gift to. So I'm all in. And by the way, I've been, set, I've been tested. I've been certified. I've been proven to know what I'm doing. I need that person in that moment. I needed to know that somebody had said yes somewhere else along the line. Read with me Matthew 25. By the way, Branson is back to normal today. We have no answers. They run all the tests, CAT scans, blood, urine, urine analysis, everything. And... We don't know. <laughs> but thankful to God that the next morning he was on his way. And by two days later, he was little old Branson saying no. <laughs> I'm going to try to close here. Matthew 25, verse 14. It said, it's also the kingdom of heaven is like a man who's going off on an extended trip. Now, I know this story is mainly talking about money, Okay. But more than that, it's talking about stewardship over the things that God gives you. How do you manage what God gives you? The reference is toward money. But I believe it applies deeper than that. He said, he called his servants together and delegated responsibilities. To one, he gave $5,000. To another, $2,000. And to the third one, $1,000. Depending on their abilities. Depending on their abilities. One more time. Depending on their abilities, the master gave them what he thought they could handle. You know what that means? That means there's not a person in this room that has a gift that God didn't give you the ability to manage it or to operate under it. If it's in your life, it's in your life for a purpose and a reason. And then he left, and right off, the first servant went out and worked, doubled and doubled his master's investment. The second did the same, but the man with a single thousand dug a hole and carefully buried his master's money. And after a long absence, the master uh, of those three servants came back and settled up with them. The one who gave 5,000 showed him how he had doubled his investment. His master commended him, said, good work, you did your job, and from now on, be my partner. Right? Said the, the next servant with the 2,000 showed how he had also doubled his master's money. And the master commended him and said, good work, for you did a good job. Well, job well done. From now on, be my partner. And the servant who was given 1,000 said, master, I know you have high standards and hate careless ways. And that you demand the best and you make no allowances for, uh, for error. I was afraid I might disappoint you. And so I found a good hiding place and I secured your money. Here it is, safe and sound, down to the last cent. I didn't do anything with it. Let 
Don't be that guy. Don't be that lady. Don't be the one who, when the master shows up, you say, you know what? I didn't do anything with what you gave me. Nothing. Nada. Zero. Zilch. Aren't you happy? The master was furious. That's a terrible way to live. That's a terrible way to live. That is a terrible way to live. It's criminal to live cautiously like that. If you knew what I was after the best, why did you do less than the least? The least you could have done would have been to invest the sum with the bankers where at least I would have gotten a little return, a little interest on my money. Take the thousand and give it to the one who risked the most. And get rid of this play it safe who won't go out on a limb. Throw him out into outer darkness. I know there are people in this room. Everyone in this room has a purpose. Now think about it. 100%. Every one of you have a purpose. God created you and made you to do uh, something very special and very unique. The question is, are you able? Are you willing? Have you said yes to him? Will you put it to work? Will you try it? Or are you just sitting on it? Saying one day, maybe, hey, I got this text message. I got, you know, hold on. Mama said... Daddy, you know, I would, but I got, you know, I got this thing. I remember when I was young, and I've shared this with you guys before, but I saw a homeless man. I was in Tallahassee, living in Tallahassee. I saw a homeless man, and I rode by him. And I would encourage everybody to just stop, but if you feel called to, you need to. I was riding by, and I saw him, and I said, God, send somebody by. Help that man. I mean, my heart was broken. I'm like, help that man. And I drove right on by. Help him. And when I got past him, I mean, it's just quick as I ever heard God speak to me. I just heard him say, I did send him and he just passed him. <laughs> he just drove right by him. Hear my God, send somebody else. What's up with that? Don't be the person that when we meet Jesus face to face and he says, hey, what'd you do with what I gave you? What'd you do with it? Some of you are meant to smile. You know that? You are. You really are. I mean, you just naturally you sit there and you're just smiling. I mean, and you don't even know why you're smiling, but you're smiling. You smile on good days. You smile on bad days. You're the person we want at the front door. <laughs> we don't want, you know, it's not offense, but we want to work hard to find out whose people's gifts are and what they're gifted. But if you're not, if, like, if you have no desire to encounter people or engage people, that's okay. How many knows that some people are like that and some people aren't? It's fair. It's fair. You put me in a room full of people I don't know, and I'm just going to like in a few minutes, I'm like, hey, what's, I'm going to have phone numbers. We're going to be going out the weekend. I mean, you know, that's just who I am. But not everybody's like that. So we don't want to grab the guy because there's a need and drag him over here, you know. And he, he don't want to talk to nobody and stick him at the front door and say, hey, greet everybody. <laughs> we want him to say yes, but we want to walk through the process and find that gift, that place, that mission that he's called to do. When you say yes, you join this crowd. You know, Noah said yes when God asked him to build the ark. <laughs> Can you imagine that? People laughing and making fun of, oh, Noah, look at his boat. They'd never even seen rain. But Noah said yes to God. Abraham said yes to God when he asked him to sacrifice his only son. You know, knowing that, me knowing that, it'd be hard for me to justify anything God ever asked of me being too hard. I'm like, no, I don't have what Abraham had. But Abraham said yes. Joseph said yes when God asked him to forgive his brothers who beat him and sold him into slavery. How hard would that have been to forgive them? Team wants to come on out. Y'all come on. 
Moses said yes when God told him to go to Pharaoh and to ask him to let the Israelites go. Rahab said yes when asked to hide the Israelite spies and risk their own lives for the lives and the lives of her family. You remember that story? She hung the cord out the wall. David said yes when God asked him to fight Goliath with only a slingshot and a few stones. One of my favorite stories. Esther, she said yes. She said yes. Mordecai came to her and said, look, uh, go to the king and petition him to save our nation and release the nation. For maybe, who knows, you were born for such a time as this. Esther said yes. Daniel said yes when God told him, Daniel, do not bow down and worship any other idol. He said, yes, God. Mary said yes when the angel told her that she would carry God's son, Emmanuel, God with us, Jesus. The disciples said yes when Jesus asked them to leave everything behind and follow him. I love Peter. I identify with him. But Peter got it right. He got it wrong. He got it right. Got it wrong. And then one day he's walking down the street and his shadow's raising the dead and healing people. Paul said yes when God asked him to deliver the good news of Jesus to the Gentiles. Aren't you glad he said yes this morning? That's why we hear the gospel today. Thank God. There was a little boy with a few loaves and fish who had his lunch. Jesus said, hey, can I borrow that? (laughs) Can I borrow that for a little while? And the little boy said, yes. Jesus fed thousands. But then there's the greatest yes of all. The greatest yes of all was when Jesus was in the garden of Gethsemane and he was praying, Father, let this cup pass from me. Not, no, God, let there be another way. Let there be another time, another way, God. I Please let it pass from me. But in the midst of his agony, in the midst of his struggle, he found the courage and the strength and he said, but not my will, your will be done. I hear you. He said yes to you. Will you say no to him? Will you say no to him? I want to pray for us right now. I'm just going to pray. If you're in this room, this would be a good time so thankful for the ministry leaders among us and the men and women I know you guys are in the trenches doing it but only you know where you're at some of you here you hadn't said yes in a while you've been busy we love you God loves you it's been an opportunity you don't have to confess it out loud just be an opportunity to say right now God I say yes to you you want me to lead a small group I'll lead one I'll say, yes, God, I'll do it. You want me to grab a teenager, mentor him, disciple him? I'll do it. I'll do it. You want me to dig deep in kids' ministry? I'll do it, God. Lord, you want me to stand at the front door and wave everybody in? I'll do it. I'll do it. Lord, you want me to sweep? You want me to clean, God? You want me to mow grass? I'll do it. Lord, you want me to sing? I'm tired of sitting back. I'll sing. You want me to teach? I'll teach, God. You want me to evangelize? I'll evangelize, God. You want me to go to Africa? I'll go. You want me to go to Peru? I'll go. You want me to go to Israel? I'll go. Lord, you want me to go to India? I'll go. You want me to go to China? I'll go. Father God, give us courage and strength, God, to say yes. To raise our hands and say yes. first step to saying yes to anything in God is saying yes to salvation.
you're here this morning and you've not said yes to Jesus. He's knocked on your heart. He's called. He's whispering your name and you're struggling to say yes. I want to pray with you. If you hear him, I hear him calling you this morning. I want you to pray a prayer with him. I'm going to invite the whole church. I want you to pray with me for confidence sake. And I pray if you're here and you need to know Jesus, you want to make that decision. You hear him calling your name. You hear him drawing you. We're just going to say yes to him right now. So pray with me. Will you, church? Jesus, I hear you calling. And I say yes. I say yes to your leadership. I say yes to you leading my life. I say yes to you guiding my heart. I say yes to you leading my soul. I surrender all that I am, all my life, all my passions, all my dreams, my vision. I lay it at your feet and I say yes to you. It's in the mighty name of Jesus I pray. Amen. Amen. Come on, give Jesus a hand. We have